everyone for joining us. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us for today's keynote series, Pleasure is Our Revolution, Sex Positivity as Sexual Violence Prevention, presented by Jen Mason. My name is Kat. My pronouns are she and her. I'm the Prevention and Social Change Manager at WICSAP, the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. We're so excited to bring you this series of dynamic keynote presentations and discussions virtually this year in place of our usual in-person conference. I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. As your host entity, I want to acknowledge the WICSAP office is physically in Olympia, Washington, which is on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Nisqually and Saxon Island peoples. Olympia and the South Puget Sound region are covered by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, signed under duress in 1854. However, I'm zooming in from Richmond, Virginia today, as I know many of you are zooming in from everywhere. So I want to acknowledge I'm on the traditional land of the Powhatan people. You can use, um, if you would like to find out the land of the peoples that you are on, you can text your zip code or your city and state to 855 917-5263. Um, and you can also use the website and Sue has posted both of those in the chat. We're all guests on this land and with humility and reverence, we wanna set that tone for our training with this fact at the forefront of our minds. Sue and I from Wixap will be doing the Zoom hosting and tech support for today. We'll give you a few tips before we get started. Since we are in webinar mode, you can use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions you have for Jen. You're welcome to also use the chat feature, um, but for really specific questions, they can sometimes get lost in the chat. So we do encourage you to use the Q&A to make sure we can address those um, where we have space in the presentation. In the top right corner, you should see what looks like nine square or nine little squares next to the word view. You can click on that to adjust your speaker view. Um, once Jen begins sharing her slides, you will be able to see both the slides and Jen and the ASL interpreters at the same time. You can use a little vertical slide bar to adjust the ratio to make the slides or the speakers larger or smaller. If you'd like to also have less on your screen, you can also choose to hide non-video participants so you don't see the other panelists who have their video off. Um, as you heard, we are recording today. Um, we are excited to make this available going forward after today's presentation. This workshop is a really exciting piece of this keynote series. It's really here to bring a sex positive lens to prevention, shifting the goal from consensual transactions to pleasurable play. Jen will be exploring mainstream sexual norms from foreplay to fake orgasms and how they perpetuate a sex negative rape culture. In an effort to envision beyond more than simply consent, we will also discuss sexual liberation, lessons learned from BDSM, and what happens when we make good sex our ultimate goal. So very excited for Jen to dig into this with us today. So I will turn it over to you. There we go. Great. Thank you so much. And I'd like to acknowledge I'm up um, in Bellingham, Washington, and I'm on the land of the Coast Salish people and the Nooksack tribe. Um, I'm Jen Mason. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I, let's see here. Are you all seeing me? Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, I'm the owner of Wink Wink. And uh, we are, let's hold on a second. I'm gonna try and, there we go. We are um, a all ages inclusive, not creepy sex shop up in Bellingham, Washington. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what that means. Um, we are all ages, which is fully legal. Um, we don't sell any age restricted products like pornography. So we're allowed to have um, people of all ages in the store. And that was an intentional choice because I feel like um, uh, inclusive, positive information about sex benefits all people. And as we'll talk about, we know that people will learn from somewhere. And I'd like to be a place where um, young people can 
come and um, we provide accurate information that's shame free. And um, yeah, so we're one of the only all ages shops in the nation. Um, we're inclusive, which uh, means that we try to have products for all people. Um, we are queer inclusive, trans inclusive. Uh, our products in our shop are not divided by like men's products and women's products. Um, we divide them by body parts or just types of toys. Um, we have lots of things in the shop like chest binders and other gender affirming items. So um, we try to be inclusive of, of um, as, as many people as we possibly can be. Um, I, I say we're not creepy store, which is something our customers described us as, and we adopted it. Um, traditional sex shops tend to have a certain look and feel to them that isn't necessarily um, for some people doesn't feel safe or doesn't feel comfortable. So we've positioned ourselves as somewhere that feels clean and the windows are open and we have plants. And if you're walking by, you might think, is that a shoe store or like a soap store? But no, we're a sex store. So we try to um, try to be a place that feels open and welcoming and is uh, providing a different vibe than a lot of other shops. Um, we are certified as a community sexual health resource by the Center for Sexual Pleasure and Health, which means that all of our staff have gone through a significant training um, that is focused on uh, body safe toys, how to use toys safely, how to um, talk about toys in an inclusive way. Um, so a lot of our staff has gone through or all of our staff has gone through quite a lot of training to, to do their jobs. Okay, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the shop is that on top of on the store itself, we also do classes. And so that is a big educational component of the work that we do. We educate customers in the shop, but then we also do classes, which are all online right now. And those classes have included so many different things from things like, you know, orgasms for everyone and BDSM 101 to um, sex positive parenting. We just did a class a couple of days ago on intimacy and menopause, um, queer sex. So we tried to offer um, education on topics that folks don't know a whole lot about. Okay. There we go. Um, this is um, a portion of our mission statement for the shop, which is we celebrate sexual expression and exploration, banish shame and help our customers to better love themselves and others. Um, we know that folks tend to have a lot of shame around sex and that's a big part of what we'll be talking about today. Um, and for a lot of customers, it's their first time talking openly about sex. I've had people, um, you know, a lot of customers who, when I ask them, well, what do you like? What, you know, what sensations do you like? They've said, I guess I've never really thought about it. No one's asked me before. I don't know. Um, people can be really nervous when they come in because it can feel like a difficult topic to broach with somebody. But what's really cool is that I have the opportunity to see what these open discussions um, can do and the empowerment that comes from um, providing a space where folks can talk about sex and their desires and what they like and what their challenges are and feel like they're not gonna be judged and to come out on the other side and feel like, okay, I can pursue what I want and, um, and that's acceptable and my pleasure matters. So I happen to think I have a very cool, fun job. I feel very honored to work with the people who come into our store. It's just really wonderful. Okay, hang on one second. I'm just gonna adjust my screen situation. Okay. Um, a little bit about me. So I am a certified sex educator and sex coach. Um, sex coaching means I do one-on-one -on -one work with people. I can, um, it's talk-based and when folks are having um, any issues related to sex, which might be desire mismatch or um, difficulty with orgasm or wanting to pursue some sort of sex that they think they might like, but are more unfamiliar with. Um, then we do talk-based sessions where I can help folks reach their goals around sex. Um, I also, this is what's very cool for me for today is um, I spent the entire first part of my career doing sexual assault prevention for domestic violence and sexual assault services of Whatcom County. So um, if you had uh, talked to me like 15 years ago, I would have been a person who was attending this workshop. Um, and so I was there for about 10 years doing prevention work. And then um, I also did um, fundraising and development. 
I was a volunteer there before and worked with clients. Um, and so my background, the basis of my thinking and the lens that I view the world really comes from um, a sexual assault prevention um, lens. And so, uh, so it's just, it's really fun for me to be here today. And I was so excited to be asked to do Wix app presentation because I was like, oh my gosh, I, Wix app was like a big part of my life for a while. And, um, I don't know, it's just exciting to, to kind of come back in this way. Okay. One second. I'm just going to do one more screen adjustment. Okay. There we go. Okay. So there's the question of um, why does this work matter? You know, a lot of folks here, okay, well, I own, I own a sex shop. And so um, it's just all fun and, um, you know, all lighthearted and it's just, it doesn't really matter. It's just kind of a fun thing. And I think that this work is deeply important for a couple of reasons that are relevant to us today. First of all, pleasure matters. Um, I think pleasure is what makes life worth living, the parts of life, life that make us feel good. And I don't mean necessarily like hedonistic pleasure. I mean, I mean, things that make us feel alive, things that make us feel loved, connected, joy, intimacy, um, you know, pleasure really matters. And our culture has a somewhat strained relationship with pleasure. Um, there's a lot of guilt that comes along with pleasure. And I don't just mean sexual pleasure. I mean, pleasure in general. We talk about guilty pleasures, you know, pleasures we're supposed to feel bad about. Um, there are a lot of stereotypes and like race-based assumptions around pleasures where, um, you know, there may be more judgment for certain people who are engaging in certain types of pleasure than others. Um, but I think that pleasure really matters. And I think that sexual pleasure matters. And that's a big part of what we'll be talking about today. You know, sexuality is a is a major part of our lives. It's a big part of our identity. Um, not everybody has sex or not everybody has romantic relationships, um, but those identities are also still important to who we are. But for folks who um, have sex and are having romantic relationships, um, that intimacy is, is often deeply important to, to our lives. You know, sex has the potential to be um, healing and make us feel adventurous and wild and vulnerable and intimate and connected and rebellious and excited you know it has all of these um all of these gifts that it can bring to our life and it can also be deeply painful and it can also be challenging and embarrassing and awkward and so i think talking about sexual pleasure really matters um, it, it's something that we ignore quite a lot, but I think is actually a deeply important part of who we are and what our relationships are. Um, it's also really important in sexual assault prevention work. I know for myself, and I don't know if any of you ever struggle with this, but one of my ch biggest challenges when I was doing sexual assault prevention work, and I'm sure like a lot of you, I was you know, primarily in middle schools and high schools doing prevention, um, talking to lots and lots and lots and lots of young people. And there was always this kind of persistent worry that what I was doing wasn't believable. Um, that what I was doing wasn't, like I wasn't selling it. Um, because ultimately, prevention educators are kind of salespeople, right? You have a vision. You want people to adopt what it is that you are selling to them. You want them to to adopt the behaviors and the mindset and the values that you are bringing. And in order to do that, you have to be, you know, believable and relevant. And there was always for me this kind of like worry that what I was doing was a little bit maybe detached from what was actually happening on the ground or that I was selling part of a vision, but not like a full vision. And what I found is that when I um, came into the work that I'm doing now, which um, is very focused on pleasure and sex positivity, which is what we're talking about today, I really found that for me, it completed the framework, that it was the missing piece for me that said, oh, here's how sexual assault prevention can be more effective, can be more believable, is if we put sexual assault prevention within to a pleasure sex positive framework. 
And so to me, this work matters. I still consider myself somebody who's doing sexual assault prevention work because I think that what we do at the shop and with our classes um, is sexual assault prevention. So, um, so I really consider myself somebody who's still kind of part of the sexual assault prevention world. Okay, there we go. So here's our plan for today. Um, we'll talk about what messages people are receiving about sex talk about the difference between sex negativity and sex positivity. We'll talk about sexual uh, liberation. Um, we'll talk about how does some sexual assault prevention work reinforce problematic messages. So exploring in the work that we're doing, are we sometimes reinforcing things that we actually um, should be working to combat? And then we'll talk about how you can implement sex positivity into your work. So that's the plan for today. Um, a couple things I wanna say. So first of all, we'll be talking about sex. That should be pretty obvious by now. Um, if you're not used to talking about orgasms in the morning, welcome to my world. Um, I know that sometimes even if you talk about trauma uh, for you know, your professional life, sometimes talking about sex, um, and pleasure can still be pretty uncomfortable. So I guess I just want to throw that out there that this is, you know, we will be talking about good sex and sexual pleasure and um, notice how that feels for you. Because I know for me, when I was doing sexual assault prevention work, particularly in the very beginning, I was still pretty uncomfortable talking about pleasure. And I think that that is not necessarily a unique experience. So notice those feelings that you're having as we're talking about pleasure. I want to acknowledge that communities are all different and the work that you're doing all looks different um, and the work that your community is ready for or wants is going to look really different. So I'm up in Bellingham. Um, we have um, a community that can handle an all ages sex shop. I'm also an elected official on the Bellingham school board and that's something that works for us. That is not something that's going to work for everywhere. So for some of you, you may hear this and think, I'm already basically doing sex positive prevention. Some of you may hear this and think, I would be kicked out of schools <laughs> if I said any of this or um, if I you know, adopted kind of this framework. So I just wanna acknowledge that all communities are gonna be different and what you're already doing is gonna look different. So this is gonna apply differently um, wherever you're at. On that note, feel free to um, take what's useful here and throw away what's not useful. I am but one person with um, one brain and one perspective and, um, you know, that has certain privileges and certain frameworks that I'm looking at. And so you may not find any of this relevant or some of this not relevant and that's okay. Um, you will be getting slides and a resource list afterwards. So I know sometimes people are like frantically taking notes um, uh, to copy the slides down, but I believe you'll be getting that afterwards. And um, please participate in the chat. If I'm saying things that you agree with, don't agree with, have thoughts on, um, the hardest part of presenting on Zoom, especially like this, is that I can't see anyone. <laughs> so I have no idea how things are going um, unless you're in the chat. So please feel free to um, be rowdy over in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on it in case there are questions and comments in there. And we're actually gonna start immediately um, with some questions for all of you, which is a reflection. So you can drop this into the chat. Um, where did you learn about sex and relationships? And, that, and this is a question that can be either you or like the royal you. Where do people learn about sex and relationships? So go ahead and drop that into your chat. We'll wait for some responses to go in here. So lots and lots of like movies, media, friends, family, community, online mostly, church. From my mom in a sex a sex positive youth camp for eighth graders. Oh my gosh, that sounds cool. Friends, family, from abusive partners. Yep, sometimes we are um, learning from folks who um, are abusive. Friends. Oh, friends. For some reason, you said friends, and I was thinking like the TV show Friends, <laughs> books, queer community. 
a lot of purity culture. Yep. Trauma counselor, Catholic church. Yeah. So there's a, a common set of places that, that people tend to learn from, right? So um, we have kind of the people who are closest to us. We have family members. Um, sometimes family members do a really good job of teaching us about sex in ways that make us feel good about themselves. Um, sometimes uh, family members are teaching us because they are um, they're teaching us in ways that are abusive, that we have to work really hard to unlearn later on. We might be learning from friends, from folks we go to school with, um, from media at large, you know, books, now social media, movies, TV, um, church, the community around you. I like, found uh, porn in a friend's attic. Yep, I think that a lot of us probably stumbled across porn at some point and we're like, okay, I'm learning a lot from this, right? Not always um, necessarily good stuff, but learning, learning, um, it's still learning. So there's lots of places where we learn about sex and relationships. We're getting all of this information from all of these different places, right? Um, I noticed like pretty much only one person in here said you actually went somewhere where they actually taught you about sex. So while this is changing, um, this is changing in Washington state because of referendum 90 and sex education um, is, is required now, comprehensive sex education. And so that'll be changing in the future. It's still gonna take a while for the impacts of that to, um, to sink in. And it's also, even if we add sex education in schools that's more comprehensive, it's still only one place, right? So we tend to think about like, oh, well, there'll just be sex education in schools and then we never have to talk about it anywhere else. And it's like, look at all the other places people are learning about sex and relationships. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you another question. What were the messages you received about sex? Or what are the messages that you think people commonly learn about sex? So not just sexual assault, but what are the messages you received about sex in general? <laughs> sex is bad and evil unless you're straight and married and then it's your duty. Yep, sex is for male pleasure. It's dirty. As a woman, my role in sex is to please a man, wait for marriage. You'll get pregnant, so don't do it. A lot of just don't do it. Virginity is precious only once you're married. Women shouldn't want or enjoy sex too much. It's private. How to pleasure a man, not so much about my own pleasure. You're dirty if you have sex and especially if you enjoy it. It's not okay to talk about. Sex is very passionate. You might get thrown against a wall during it. As long as it's consensual and safe, I was supported from home at school, a slut if you do, a prude if you don't. Yep, that kind of double standard. I'm too young to be a grandma. Yep. Sex is just something you have to do, not focus on female pleasure. Yeah, you've all basically done my entire presentation. <laughs> um, most of these messages are pretty negative. And I will tell you that this week, um, well, the, for, the, for the past few weeks, I have been talking to seventh and eighth graders. I've been at a Montessori school in Bellingham teaching sex education. And I asked them the same question. I asked a lot, I asked basically every presentation I do the same questions. What were the messages you received about sex? And I will tell you that the answers that you have are very similar to what seventh and eighth graders told me um, just last week when I asked them this same question. So. While I think some things are changing in how we talk about sex and how we talk about sexual assault, the messages that people are getting are largely the same, um, that we're all in many ways still surrounded by these very negative messages about sex. And this last um, thing in the chat, the messages aren't just negative, they're confusing, right? They're, they're very confusing. They, the way we think about sex um, in, in the dominant culture is, it requires a lot of like mental gymnastics to try and understand because we're deeply uncomfortable with it. And so it's like, we kind of make all of these rules about it that don't make any sense and that nobody can ever really follow and be successful at. So um, what most of you talked about 
is called sex negativity. And unfortunately, I think every single time that I have asked this question, while some people have positive answers for what they've learned, most of us um, have more negative answers. And whether that's because we have actually received more negative messages or because those are the ones that stick out in our head, we have to acknowledge that the context of our culture, the context that we're doing sexual assault prevention work in is very negative about sex in general. So I'm gonna talk about what sex negativity actually is and you all have covered um, much of this with the messages that you shared. First of all, sex negativity in general views sex as taboo. Um, in our culture, it's still, I think, more taboo to talk about sex than it is to have sex. I can think of very few other things that most people, most adults and young adults are doing, but that we are not supposed to talk about openly. It's still very taboo to acknowledge the sex that we're having. And that taboo is kind of a spectrum where there are some things that are more taboo and some things that are less taboo. But overall, sex is something that we're still really not supposed to talk about um, and that we're supposed to stay silent about. There are all these kind of rules about that. Um, it, it brings up for me the idea of what's called sex exceptionalism where we treat sex differently than anything else, right? Where it's like, it's like we teach sex, we might be teaching sex about sex, but it's like only this one person is gonna talk to you about sex. And it's not gonna be your teachers, your family, it's gonna be this one educator. And it's created like by law, what they can talk to you about. And they can only use certain words and only certain times, right? We have like sex as this, as this separate thing that's over here. And it's not ingrained in the rest of our education, the rest of our culture. It's like this thing that's kind of like behind a curtain that we're not supposed to acknowledge. And it, even when we do talk about it, it's in these highly controlled specific ways because overall we still think of it as something that we're not supposed to be acknowledging. Sex negativity uses shame as a tool to shape behavior. I think that sex and shame um, is, gosh, even for folks who had relatively healthy upbringings around sex, from my perspective as somebody who works in a sex shop, I think that most people experience shame around sex in one way or another. Um, you know, when you're doing sexual assault prevention, the conversation about shame is often about how survivors feel, may feel shame um, for, for, for being victimized, right? That this feeling of shame is so common for survivors and sexual assault um, can bring up those feelings. But I also think that like sex in general brings up a lot of shame, that sexual assault um, is shameful or that survivors can feel it's shameful because sex in general is shameful, right? It's not to say just um, abusive behavior is, is brings up feelings of shame. It's like the whole thing, you could be having the best, most consensual sex and still have a lot of shame associated with it. Um, shame can just be sort of a general thing for those of you who said, you know, you were taught the messages that you got where you're not supposed to enjoy it. You're not supposed to even be having sex. Um, sex itself can just bring up shame. I also, you know, from working in, in the shop and talking to people about sex, there's also a lot of specific situations that bring shame where people feel like, the desires they have are shameful, or the fact that they struggle with orgasm is shameful, or they're having erectile challenges, or they have low desire or not as much desire as their partner does, um, or maybe they want to masturbate and that's something that has been frowned upon or shamed. Um, the fact that they like pornography or look at pornography um, can feel shameful. So there's all of this shame that's really associated with sex. When we're talking about sexual assault prevention, um, you know, we know that experiencing shame, particularly sexual shame, is a risk factor for somebody 
being a perpetrator. So I think that eradicating um, shame around sex in general is part of prevention work. Um, it's not just, oh, people feel better about sex if they don't have shame about it. When we address the shames that are around sex and our wants and our desires and our limits and our boundaries and these shames that we hold so deeply, um, I think that is part of sexual assault prevention. Sex negativity focuses overwhelmingly on risks and negative consequences. Um, and often this focuses on STIs and unintended pregnancy. And that is good information to know. I am not arguing that we should not be educating people on STIs or um, unintended pregnancy. I think that we should be talking about that and we should be talking about how to reduce risks, right? But the way that we've traditionally talked about sex is that it's focused primarily on that. And it makes sex seem like this thing that it, you dip your toe into it and just horrible things are going to happen to you immediately, right? And we know that there are ways of, that, you know, there are ways of reducing risk. And we also know that there are lots and lots of good parts of sex, that there are benefits to our lives and to our relationships. Sex negativity kind of ignores those good parts and really focuses on the potential bad things. One of the other issues of this is that if a person does um, have an STI um, or becomes pregnant when they didn't intend to, because of the way our culture has talked about those things, it can be deeply shameful. It can add to the shame. Um, STI stigma is a huge issue where you know people feel like they have an STI and they will never have a relationship. They will never have love. Um, the way we talk about STIs, uh, you know, we do a lot of fear and this is a terrible thing and you, depending on what kind, you may have it forever, also scares a lot of people out of having a relationship with a person with STIs. So again, I think that there is a balance that has to happen in, we can't just focus on risk or negative consequences or we pile on to the shame and fear and silence around sex that we know can be so damaging to people. Okay, sex negativity um, denies access to education. It's like just overall discomfort about giving access to information about sex. We, we do it in highly controlled ways for young people. Um, you know, one of the things that I heard from my seventh and eighth graders in the last couple of weeks was um, some of them said, well, we have, uh, you know, parents who say that we can learn about sex, but it's like only with these certain books. And if we look at other stuff, then that's really bad, right? So sex negativity is this idea that um, we shouldn't allow people to learn about it or bad things will happen to them. And the thing is, is that whether or not we provide, intentionally provide education or not, everybody learns about sex, right? Everybody learns about sexuality. All the messages that you um, put in the chat, many of those probably weren't, nobody sat down and said, hey, just so you know, sexual pleasure is not for you. It's for the men. Oftentimes, nobody intentionally did that. You pick that up. Um, from the world around you. So everybody's gonna learn whether or not we intentionally decide to teach them. Sex negativity allows for a very narrow definition of what sex is. So I'm gonna ask this question for you to put this in the chat. When I say the word sex, what is sex? What do you think that most people think of when they think of the word sex? What does it look like? what kind of behavior, what, what, what is associated? What is sex? Missionary, straight sex, heterosex, heteronormative, engagement style for others, penis to vagina intercourse, penis and vagina. Yeah, penis inside a vagina. So again, yeah, straight sex that is, you know, missionary position, um, penis and vagina. Again, this is a thing that I've asked in like every single presentation, including the seventh and eighth graders, because I want them to have an expanded definition of what sex is. And literally every presentation I've ever done, it's like, 
penetrative sex when a penis goes into a vagina is what people think of um what you know the the first message that comes to mind because that is the message that's been given to us often for much of our life even if that's not the sex that we are having um the world around us um wants us to believe that that is what sex is and that everything else is a derivative of it so it allows for this very narrow definition and um and in sex negativity it may say okay well penetrative sex is okay you know we're, we're okay with this but all of this other stuff is not okay right so sex negativity may say penetrative sex missionary style when you're married don't enjoy it too much that's totally fine but sex where you have sex toys involved not okay um queer sex not okay bdsm not okay having sex with multiple people not okay right so sex negativity um might allow for certain kinds of sex but it's a pretty narrow definition of what it is sex negativity shames having too much sex and not enough somebody said this in the chat it's that double standard um that 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 exists much more i think for um feminine aligned folks is like you 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 can't win right because you're never supposed to say yes but you're also not supposed to say no you're kind of especially when you're younger i think there's fear of being made fun of because you're not having um any sex but there's also this very real um very real repercussions for somebody who's having a lot of sex so you just really can't win um in our culture we tend to think of sex almost as like a commodity it's almost like money where you have it and then if you give it away you have less value rather than being something that's like we can have and enjoy and um we can build upon the sex that we've had and it can get better and we can kind of play with whether or not we want to have more or less and there's not necessarily value to us as a person if we're having more sex or less sex um our culture thinks of sex as this sort of commodity that if we give too much of it away um then then we we are worth less right Sex negativity values certain body types over others that tends to be white bodies, thin bodies, um cisgender bodies, um cis sexual bodies, right? That are uh thin thin bodies that we we say sex is okay but only if you look like this, only if your body is this way. Believes only certain people deserve pleasure. You all touched on this a bit. Um sex negativity often uh really says well it's okay with um sex so long it's a, it's only certain people are having it and that the template really is set by um cisgender straight men and we'll talk about that specifically in a moment um so believes only certain people deserve pleasure um in sex negativity we say okay okay pleasure is acceptable but only if you are this kind of person and you can look through this list and it's um you know very associated with people who have privilege um cisgender men straight people people without disabilities young to middle age adults i think is like the only acceptable age range where we say well young people shouldn't be having sex also our culture is kind of uncomfortable with older people having sex you know i just we did this class at the shop on sex and menopause and it's like people don't have very much information about menopause or about how to have intimacy um after menopause and that's a problem as well and so sex is really only acceptable for this very narrow age range which i think um not coincidentally is often the age that people um may be trying to conceive pleasure is acceptable for people with conventionally attractive body and looks folks who are neurotypical who are monogamous who are vanilla right who are doing what we would consider like mainstream culturally acceptable um types of ways of having sex and white so all the we leave a lot of folks out of this this is not a comprehensive list of all of the people that we leave outside of um the pleasure paradigm that we say um that we say sex is not pleasure is not acceptable for these people and um and what's 
really awful about that is that folks go through, some folks go through their entire life without really feeling like they are deserving of sexual pleasure, that they're not deserving of um, having their needs met, their desires met, their limits met, because they are on the outside of what our culture believes um, is acceptable for who should be experiencing pleasure. Oh, I just saw somebody posted about a book, Let's Talk About It, for teens. It's such a wonderful book. We sell it at the shop, and um, it's a really, really great book. Okay, sex negativity upholds assumptions and stereotypes. Um, you know, sex exists as part of our culture, which is racist and classist and ableist and, you know, all of the isms. Um, and there are so many different, um, there are so many different ways that, you know, racism and classism and ableism and transphobia and queerphobia um, are embedded into our sex negative culture. So some of these stereotypes and assumptions are, let's say, um, people with disabilities aren't sexual people. They can't have sex, they don't want to have sex, they're not sexual people. On the other hand, um, for folks with disabilities, there are stereotypes that um, that if they do have a sexuality, um, it's like rooted in perversion, right? So there, there are, again, double standards abound in, in sex negativity. Um, some of the stereotypes and assumptions being transgender is not legit it's a deviancy instead of being something that is a valid identity. Um, fetish, fetishization is a very uh, persistent issue in sex negative cultures. Um, the reduction of a person to an object based on their identity. Um, there are so many race-based assumptions and stereotypes. You know, black men have large penises or Black people of all genders um, are hypersexual. And that has been a very persistent um, racial stereotype that was rooted in one of the justifications for chattel slavery and for, um, for in, in, uh, enslavers to um, rape women um, was this kind of, was this uh, stereotype that, well, Black people are hypersexual. And that has been something that we have seen persist, this, this stereotype. Um, there are stereotypes about people who are Asian, um, you know, Asian women being subservient or docile, um, there to serve your needs. And so sex negativity just allows these stereotypes and assumptions and aggressions based on those stereotypes to persist. We just say, these are acceptable. Um, these are, are, they remain unchallenged. Sex negativity defaults to straight cisgender men as the priority and the ideal template. Um, you know, we see from what you all told me, penetration is kind of prioritized as like, this is, this is the best sex or this is the ideal sex and everything else is like a derivative, right? Um, one of the ways that we see this, uh, I see this all the time in my shop is that for vulva owners, it's relatively uncommon that penetration is going to be the way that they reach an orgasm. It's much more common um, for clitoral stimulation to be what leads to orgasm. Different for everybody. That's not to say that there aren't people who have penetration and that's the way we orgasm, but it's much more common. However, lots and lots of vulva owners do not know that or they think that something is wrong with them. Because we have said, here's the right way, here's the acceptable way to have sex. And if you don't orgasm from that, something must be wrong with your body, right? We see um, the, often in relationships, um, straight relationships where it's like, whatever the man's desire level is, is considered the like standard that's, so it's like, if he has a higher desire and she has a lower desire, um, it's like, well, this person obviously has a problem. I mean, in general, uh, we tend to think that the person has lower desire has like an issue rather than just they have lower desire and maybe that's fine and not a problem. Um, but there are many, many ways, many examples of how we default to straight cisgender men to kind of set what the norm is. And it means if you're outside of that, you experience life differently, you experience sex and desire differently than this one template, um, it, 
it can feel like something is wrong with you or that there is an issue. And sex negativity believes that um, open sexual communication is embarrassing and unsexy. And I think that this is probably one of the biggest issues of sex negativity is that um, we tend to think of talking about sex as like this interruption to good sex rather than something that's part of it, rather than something that could make it better. And not just because you're not harming someone, but that because talking about sex can be super erotic and very hot and can get you more of what you want to experience and help you please your partner better. Um, lots and lots of people think of communication about sex as being cold and clinical. And therefore, when we are teaching consent in a culture that believes acknowledging sex is cold and clinical, consent itself becomes cold and clinical. If communicating about sex is unsexy, then consent is unsexy also, right? Because we have a culture that just doesn't, hasn't been taught that communication is not just essential. It's not just a checkbox. It's part of what can make sex really, really good. Um, and I think sometimes we end up reinforcing this. And I mean the royal we, and I mean myself when I was doing sexual assault prevention, we end up reinforcing that sexual communication is unsexy by giving very unsexy examples about how to communicate around sex. That we say, no, communication about sex is great. Look, you can say to your partner, would you like to have oral sex? I would like that. And it's like, we're not helping the cause here, you know, by, by, by offering up examples that sort of reinforce the idea that sexual communication is not a hot thing to do. And the last part is sex negativity really treats relationships, I think teen relationships and teen sexuality at best with kind of ambivalence. There are not a lot of people who are saying to teenagers, to young adults, I want you to have a good sex life. I want you to enjoy your sexuality. Your sexual well being is important to me. I don't want you to just not get hurt. I want this to be a good part of your life that you feel confident in, that you enjoy, that you look forward to. Most young people are not hearing that. Or if they are hearing that, it is a small fraction of the messages that they're getting. I think. We, we treat teen sexuality at best with kind of ambivalence. We often treat it with condescension. We often treat it with hostility. Um, that there are a lot of young people who are getting the message of like, you should ask for consent and talk to your partner about sex. Also, you might be a terrible person for wanting to have sex, right? that they're learning that they should talk to their partner or they should be, um, you know, they're learning about consent in this environment that's like, also you're kind of a bad person for wanting sex in general. And that makes it very, very, very hard to learn when, um, when, when teenagers are, are feeling like the world around them is hostile to their sexuality. Um, when we're unclear, if we want teens to have relationships, if we want teens to um, enjoy their sexuality, it adds to secrecy and shame. I'm not saying we should be like promoting everyone should have sex, right? But when we are ambivalent or hostile to teen sexuality, it means when they're pursuing it, that they often do so in a context of secrecy and a context of shame that really kind of, it, it piles on, right? It piles on to this shame that can already be there. So sex negativity is not usually a healthy space for young people to honestly pursue um, pleasure and for them to honestly pursue a sex life and a sexuality that makes them feel good. And again, that sexuality or sex life could be not having it, but they're not really allowed to explore and decide and talk about it and learn because we have a lot of negativity towards young people's relationships. So overall, the takeaway from that very kind of depressing first part is that 
teaching sexual assault prevention in a sex negative po- a sex negative context makes it difficult for the work to be believable. And going back to what I said in the beginning, this was for me always the fear that what I was trying to teach with prevention wasn't being picked up. It wasn't believable. And what was missing for me was that perspective of, oh, it's not believable because I'm ignoring that we live in a sex negative culture. I'm not addressing all of these negative messages that um, are related to sex that many people are getting. So, you know, if you imagine um, teaching a young person to drive, let's say, and, you know, young people learn to drive and it's this very neutral experience. Like they see people drive their entire lives then they go to driver's ed and they learn, they learn maybe some about the mechanics of how it works. They learn how to avoid accidents but people teach them to drive and they want them to be good drivers and then they pass the test and then they enjoy driving. And sometimes bad things happen, but often they come out on the other side of it and um, and that we don't think they're a horrible, awful person for what has happened, right? Driving is very neutral. Imagine if we tried to teach people to drive in the same way that we taught about sex, where we're saying, here's some information on driving, but also, you're not supposed to enjoy driving. You're kind of a maybe a bad person if you even want to drive. Here's information about driving, but I'm not even sure you should drive. And people might judge you for driving. Also, everyone's going to drive, but we're all not going to talk about it. Okay? It seems ridiculous when we apply it to another context. And you know what? It would be very hard to learn to drive if I was being bombarded with these messages around driving. Um, all these value messages around driving. Um, It'd be very hard for me to learn driving in a way that um, where I can fully sort of um, adopt, you know, safety measures. And I can, because I'm going to be like, should I even be doing this? I I guess I should keep it a secret. And um, I guess it doesn't really matter if I'm safe or not, because I'm not supposed to be doing this anyway, right? It would be very difficult. Um, There are a variety of things that I think challenge um, sexual assault prevention in being believable. You know, one of those things is, um, and and I think this is true, not just for young people, but adults. We say a lot of things like, talk to your partner about about your, your boundaries. Lots of people have never talked to anyone about sex in general. Lots of people don't know what their boundaries are. They don't know what their desires are because no one's ever asked them before. So sometimes we can say things, so um, as though it's easy, we just suggest that people talk to their partners when that is a huge, huge thing to do in a culture that has decided talking about sex is taboo, right? I can tell you from working in the shop that um, it's very common um, for, for me to say to somebody who's maybe coming into a sex shop for their first time and they're looking for a toy, their first toy, and um, you know, an adult. And I ask, well, what kind of sensations do you like? You know, if this is a vulva owner, it's like, well, do you like um, internal stimulation or do you like external stimulation? It's very common that the answer is, I don't know, right? Very common that folks haven't really ever had the opportunity or had somebody ask or have ever paused to think about whether the sex that they're having is the sex that they actually like or enjoy. So um, when we say just talk to your partner about it, just tell them what you like and tell them what you don't like. Lots of people don't know that. And lots of people have never had these conversations about sex in general. Um, you know, outside of sexual assault prevention, um, we, we talk a lot about say STI testing, there are a lot of people and a lot of adults that feel uncomfortable bringing up sex at all with their medical providers. I also know that there are a lot of medical providers that are very uncomfortable talking about sex, right? So that's again, kind of an easier said than done. Um, you know, we, we talk about asking for consent, but we don't acknowledge that, um, that rejection is very, very difficult. Um, We often don't talk about what to do when the answer 
we talk about, you know, you need to respect the no, but we don't talk about how difficult that is to hear a no and what you're supposed to do with that. Um, we leave out whole swaths of people often in prevention work um, because we don't talk about queer sex. We don't talk about um, scenarios that involve anything outside of kind of, um, you know, what you all suggested, hetero, vanilla missionary sex that we're not necessarily in our scenarios, we're not necessarily reflecting the sex that people may actually be having. And I think the biggest part, and this is what we're talking about next about sexual assault prevention, um, being sometimes difficult to believe is that we're not offering something better than what exists. We're not offering a vision. And this is for me what, what talking about sexual pleasure really, um, or, or one of the benefits was, um, you know, I felt like just telling people, here's what not to do, here's what not to do, um, you know, get consent. Consent is great, but you know, we didn't really build out that vision. Um, it, it's very difficult to believe. So I think that, that using a pleasure framework can be the thing that makes it more believable. Okay, let me see, Kayla, can you give an example of how to talk? Sorry, I'll slow down so I can read this slower. Can you give an example of how to model talking about sexual boundaries with teens that are inexperienced with sex? It, it seems more applicable with older experienced people. So I think that um, when we talk about sex, again, I'm using like the widest definition of what sex is, um, that it's not like, here's how to negotiate your sexual boundaries when you're naked and about to have penetration. Um, negotiating boundaries around your body is something that all of us have the opportunity to do whether or not we have sex or not. So, I mean, I think about, um, you know, asking people for hugs, um, uh, asking um, if you can sit there uh, before you before you sit down, right? There are ways that we can teach young people how to um, negotiate their own boundaries. Also, boundaries are rules for yourself, or, or boundaries um, are for yourself. Rules are for other people. So, young people, their boundary may be: I'm not interested in sex. I don't really. It sounds weird to me, or gross, or I I don't like it. And so, going, you know what? That is that's great. That's where you are right now. Sounds like you thought about it and learned about it and that that's not something that you're interested in. And that's awesome, right? And so we're able to um, affirm the decisions that people have made for themselves and the limits that they have made, whether no matter what age that they are. Not sure I answered that particularly well. Um, let me keep thinking on it also. But again, sexual boundaries um, are not just related to, to you know, when you're about to have intercourse, when you're about to have sex, there, there are wants for our bodies at any time in our life, right? And we can encourage younger people to think about the wants um, or the limits that they have for their own bodies, no matter what age they are. Okay, so we're going to move into the idea of what is sex positivity. This is the other side of it. This is where we're going, right? Sex positivity I want to give the caveat um, or the, I guess, clarifier that sex positivity does not mean everyone should be having sex all the time. It's not encouraging sex. It's not saying vanilla missionary heterosex is bad. Everyone should be having really kinky group sex. Okay. So I just want to clarify that in kind of those stark terms because sometimes people um, resist this idea of sex positivity because they think of it um, as, they think of it as being just like another set of standards that they have to follow. So what is sex positivity? Sex positivity believes sex is normal and sex is healthy. Um, that sex is something that a lot of people have that everybody has a sexual identity, whether or not you are having sex or not having sex. Um, and that it's like just a regular part of who we are, okay? Sex is not something that we need to feel like this taboo around that we can acknowledge it, we can talk about it. It's a normal, healthy part of our lives. Uh, sex positivity uses affirmation and choice as a tool to shape behavior. Um, the most important 
part of sex positivity, um, or one of the most important parts is that the choices that make people make for themselves are the most important ones. So I know when I was an advocate, there was kind of that line of people are the experts of their own lives, right? As an advocate, I don't make choices for um, the, the clients that I'm working with. They need to make their own choices. And it's the same way when we look at sex positivity, that a person can make choices that are different than me, but as long as they are healthy and safe, and self-defined, that's what's really important. Um, sex positivity really champions curiosity. It champions exploration and expression and giving lots of options and um, shaping behavior from that perspective instead of through shame. Sex positivity centers on pleasure. If you think about it, centering pleasure automatically means that you are, um, reducing harm. I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk about harm specifically. I'm not talking about, um, well, we shouldn't be talking about prevention at all. We should just talk about the good stuff. No. What I'm saying is that if we want for all people pleasurable sex lives, good sex lives, we want them to experience what makes them feel good. Inherently in that, we're saying harm can't happen. Part of feeling good is that bad stuff isn't happening to you. So it's it, it, harm reduction prevention is embedded within sex positivity. Um, so I think that part of making uh, sexual assault prevention believable is that we are saying, hey, I want you to have a good sex life. I want you to experience pleasure. Um, you can't experience pleasure if you're hurting somebody or if somebody is hurting you. Right, but we always come back to that idea of I want something that that's really good for you. I want something that feels really good, um, that you enjoy, that your partner enjoys. And we talk about sexual assault prevention from that perspective. Sex positivity encourages and offers access to education. Again, we know that people learn whether or not we intentionally teach them. Um, we also know that negative messages are a lot easier to adopt when we don't have any positive ones. Um, so, you know, I think about like pornography is really, really influential for a lot of young people. And we see the impacts of pornography on how sex, sex is actually happening in people's relationships. And not all of those ways are bad, but there are some major issues with how sex is happening because people are watching pornography. And the issue I would posit, I've done lots of research around pornography because it's a very controversial topic. One of the issues is not just that pornography um, causes or um, promotes negative behavior, but it's that there's not a lot of other messages to counter pornography. Pornography becomes very influential when it's one of the only ways that we're learning about sex. Uh, imagine if somebody learned to drive from watching like the Fast and the Furious, right? People can watch the Fast and the Furious and know that that's not how you're supposed to drive because we see driving our entire life. We know what driving is supposed to look like and we can go, oh, that's totally fake. That's actors who are doing this in a controlled environment. And while it might be fun for me to watch, and I might say, that looks really cool, we know that that's not the standard that is supposed to, we're supposed to adopt. Pornography is really different than that because for many people, for many young people, that's where they are learning from, that pornography is their sex education. So sex positivity um, understands that we have to make education available for people. We have to have the conversations that are scary and uncomfortable for us as adults who grew up in sex negative environments because um, giving information uh, about, about sex is, um, is, uh, is what creates sex positive, um, you know, sex positive messages. I just noticed I have positivity um, misspelled on every single slide. Um, so uh, we're gonna have some, some grace and forgiveness for my oversight. I was so excited about the content. I didn't notice that um, positivity was misspelled. <laughs> I swear it's important. <laughs> okay. 
So sex positivity allows for lots of ways to express sexuality. So it allows not just for this one narrow definition, but it says, hey, as long as what you're doing is um, consensual, as long as what you're doing, you know, is, is, um, is un you're understanding the risk, you're, you're trying to limit the risk for yourself and for other people. Um, we, they're, they're, it allows for a lot of different ways to have sex and to express sexuality. Again, the important part of it being that it's self-defined. Sex positivity affirms choices to have lots of sex or none at all. So again, it's not about everyone should be having sex all the time. Um, sex positivity can affirm that people don't want to have sex until maybe they're married or until they're in long-term relationships. Um, and that's okay. Um, it can affirm however people want to think about sex and the sex that they have for themselves. Sex positivity values all body types. Sex is not just for thin, white, cisgender people. Sex positivity is for all people, that all people deserve pleasure no matter what their bodies look like. You deserve pleasure and your partner deserves pleasure. It break, breaks down and resists assumptions and stereotypes. So sex positivity um, should be anti-racist work. It should be work where we are saying um, very clearly that uh, these stereotypes and aggressions based around race and ability and um, uh, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation are not okay. Sex positivity helps us to see those, to confront those, and to resist those. Sex positivity um, centers on individuality and personal experience. So it is challenging the idea that we have to all follow a sexual script is challenging the messages that we get from sexual scripts. And it's saying, what do you actually want? What do you like? You know, are you not interested in sex? Are you not interested in sex um, right now in your life? Are you not interested in sex and that's part of your identity? Are you um, interested in having lots and lots of sex? Are you interested in the messages that you receive from church or from your faith community? Or are you interested in deconstructing some of those, right? It centers on each person and what they um, bring to the table. It uh, really prioritizes who they are as an individual and what their experience is and what they actually want. And again, it approaches from the idea of curiosity and not condemning. And I'm sure a lot of you practice that and how you do prevention work, but sometimes because of the messages that we and judgments we have around sex that have gone unchallenged, we don't approach with curiosity that um, there's a lot of us, um, I'll give the example of pornography. I've watched a lot of really sex positive people um, and sex positive educators um, when it comes to, the, comes to the topic of pornography say deeply shameful things. Even though we know lots and lots of people watch pornography, often educators because of their own judgments about it, um, they center their own judgments and they center their own um, biases and beliefs around pornography and end up saying very deeply shameful things um, rather than focusing on the individual and rather than focusing, um, approaching with curiosity, they're approaching with like condemnation. So I think part of that, um, of sex positivity is saying, um, is being curious about people and curious about their experiences and curious about their beliefs and asking questions um, rather than coming with our own set of judgments and trying to impose that um, on, on people. And sex positivity, I think this is super important, is um, sex positivity believes communication is essential for intimacy. It's not a checkbox. It's not a, um, it's not just like, oh, that lady came to my classroom and said, I have to ask for consent. And so now I've done it. Sex positivity believes sexual communication is, is really essential for people. That talking about intimacy and pleasure is, um, is fun. 
And it's how we get more of what we like. And it's how we get more of what our partner likes. And it's how we create something that's fun and good and sexy and exciting. And it's also how we keep from harming people. It's how we keep from doing things that, um, that hurt other people. It's how we um, stop power from being abused. Communication is not a checkbox. It's not a light switch. Consent's not a light switch that you turn off and on, right? It's a state of being because it's part of, it's part of communication. And so to me, that's like, for me in the shop and when I do coaching, this is like one of the biggest issues that I see is that there's a lack of communication and there's a lack of comfort in talking about sex. We expect a lot of mind reading in sex. We expect um, people to just know what we want and what we don't want. And uh, rather than communicating with them, I had somebody who asked me um, recently, they'd said, I don't like the way my partner performs oral sex. I wish that they did it differently. Um, how can I fix that? And I said, have you um, told them? <laughs> have you, have you um, communicated what, what you would like more of? Have you communicated um, what feels good to you? And they said, no. I said, well, what do you think about trying that? They said, what, what other options are there? They really wanted there to be an option to improve um, the sex that they were receiving without actually having to say anything. And I think that's a problem. And I also think that that's extremely common. So sex positivity normalizes the idea of communication in our sex lives. So I wanna ask you um, to think for a moment here, because I've been doing a lot of talking, so I wanna take a break from talking. Where does sex negativity, where have you seen sex negativity show up in your work? And whether that's the prevention work that you do, the curriculums that you use, um, maybe some of the comments that you get in presentations, where do you see sex negativity showing up in your work? I'll give you a minute to answer. I know it's kind of, it might be a difficult question in talking about STI present prevention, young people slut shaming each other. Yes. See if there's more answers here. We can talk about risks, but never about pleasure or sex toys. Yep. It's only in the context of abuse. When I say all parties involved instead of two people and everyone giggles, yes. I just had a um, presentation, this is just responding to Shoshana's comment um, when I was talking with this, with this class and I was asking them because they're a little bit younger. Um, we talked about what's the difference between friendship and romantic relationships? What do you think is the difference between those two things? What we found is there's a lot of similarities between friendships and romantic relationships, right? That the things we should expect in a good friendship are things we should expect in a good relationship. But somebody in the class said, um, well, romantic relationships are only for two people, or you can only have one person, other person in a romantic relationship, but you can have lots of friends. And I was thinking, oh, okay, well, I should clarify that there are people who have relationships with more than one person, and we're also allowed to have more than one sexual partner. And <laughs> this um, other student in the class said, no, -uh, you can have, uh, she said, monogamy is just a norm. Monogamy is not for everyone. And I was like, oh, this is very, um, it was kind of exciting to hear that from, from like an eighth grader who, um, who was very aware of our mononormative culture. And, um, and, and the student who had said it, you could tell his brain just like, working going, oh, okay, I didn't, I, he didn't really know that. So it was interesting, but that kind of, we, we do, um, we do often uh, end up reinforcing this monogamy culture that again, monogamy is great and fine for some people. It's also not, um, it's not for everybody. It's not what everybody is practicing. Um, limits of what we can and can't talk about when going into schools. It's a huge challenge, right? 
I know that as prevention educators, you probably have lots of things that you would like to talk about to young people, but are not necessarily things that um, would be allowable in the schools that you're going into. Simply the fact that we only talk about it in the negative light, right? I mean, I, I think it's interesting that um, I have experienced this a lot in talking to folks who do prevention work or work with survivors that um, are very comfortable talking about um, sexual assault and are not comfortable talking about sexual pleasure. And um, I think that when we bring that framework to young people, it's, it's problematic, right? That when we only show sex from these negative perspectives, rather than um, all of us becoming more comfortable with the idea that um, we can also frame sex in a positive light as well. I'm discussing how stereotypes affect us personally. There being a lack of intim intimacy and connection and more about acts, right? Yeah, a lot of times um, I think people's comfort level around sex leads, it, you know, when they have a lower comfort level around sex, it feels safe to stick to the mechanics rather than the context. It feels safe to talk about anatomy and how things work rather than talking about um, intimacy, connection, desire, pleasure. Um, it can feel safer to stick to kind of the colder clinical parts of it. Um, let's see here. Sex, yeah, lots of laws around sex ed. Um, let's see here. You all have such wonderful answers in the chat. Um, when all sexual terminology is considered bad words or inappropriate in all educational or professional settings, absolutely. During depositions, lots of attorneys will try to bring up a survivor's whole sexual history as if it matters to try to make her look bad. Yep, holding people's um, you know, sexual behaviors um, against them. It's that kind of attributing um, attributing sex, like equating sex with value. Um, can feel weird as an adult to sound like you're encouraging teens to get down. I think this is one of the biggest challenges um, of, of, of adding sex positivity into the way that you talk about prevention is we don't necessarily want to be coming in and and being like, okay, everybody should have sex. Here's how to have great sex. Here's how to have pleasure, right? That's not what we're going for and would probably immediately get us kicked out of most schools. Um, so trying to find that balance of how do we talk about sex positivity without sounding like we're encouraging people to have sex. I'll let you know that this whole beginning part of the presentation is actually what I did with seventh and eighth graders. Obviously the examples I used in um, the way we discussed each of these pieces was specific more to their, um, to them. And I added in a little bit, a couple of slides for, for today, but I literally did the whole, uh, uh, in an hour with seventh and eighth graders about sex negativity and sex positivity, right? We um, talked about what negative messages are they receiving? And then we talked about sex positivity. And one of the things that I asked them about was um, after we defined sex positivity, I said, what would it be like to live in a world where you got more sex positive messages than sex negative messages? And I asked them to envision what would it be like if instead of all that negative stuff that you said that you've received, what if you were surrounded by all of this sex positive stuff we've been talking about. How would that change the way you think about yourself and your relationships and other people? And it was really amazing to hear their answers, you know, um, to hear them talk about, well, I would feel like I could, um, I would be safer because I would feel like I could actually talk to, my, I could actually ask my parents questions or, I would feel like I could actually um, tell a person when what they're doing is hurting me. Or um, they talked a lot about feeling like they would have more worth or feeling like they weren't ashamed of themselves. And it's really interesting um, to hear that from young people that 
sex positivity, they understand how sex positivity is part of prevention. It's part of um, reducing risk, right? Um, and, and a lot of them had talked about also sex positivity. They said, well, I wouldn't have to guess what other people want. I would just know. And I think that conversation is really important to have. And I guess just to respond to you, it can feel weird as an adult to, you know, when you talk about sex positivity, maybe you feel like you're encouraging people um, to have sex, but I have found it to be very successful to even just bring up sex positivity as a concept in the way that we did here today as to ask them to vision, how would that change their lives? How would that change their relationships? And you know, even for seventh graders, we talked about this in kind of a more, you know, in a way that was appropriate for their age, could really see how sex positivity um, would, would lead to better outcomes. Um, in a group of parents, having them say they can't teach their three-year-old penis and vagina because daycare thinks those are dirty words. We start sex negativity very young. Yes, we start sex negativity from an early age, shaming genitals themselves shaming um shaming them so much that we can't even name them right that we can't use the uh, correct words one of the things the seventh and eighth graders brought up was about sex negativity starting really young um was they said adults tended to sexualize things um that weren't sexual and i thought that was so fascinating um and let me tell you what they meant by that they used some examples around, um, because I said, you know, where do you see sex negative messages in your life? And they'd said, well, sometimes adults um, will pretend like babies have girlfriends or boyfriends, right? They'll say like, oh, look, that you know, these little six month olds and saying, oh, look, that's her boyfriend or, oh, look, they're on a date together while they're playing on the playground. And it was interesting to hear, you know, 11, 12 year olds, pointing out at how uncomfortable that was. But they also said that later in life, adults sexualizing things, um, you know, they said they might have a platonic relationship with somebody who's a different gender from them. And that, you know, parents or teachers would say, oh, is that your boyfriend? And they'd say, no, he's just a friend. And they'd go, oh, sure. He, I don't think he's just your boyfriend. And that made them feel deeply uncomfortable to have something sexualized that wasn't. And so, um, we, again, it's that we're very weird around sex in that we are like, don't use the word penis or vagina for your child, but it's okay to like pretend that they have a boyfriend or girlfriend. It's, it's just very odd what we have decided is acceptable, um, around, around sex. Okay. And move forward here. So what we are, what I would say that I think we should be moving towards is the idea of sexual liberation and sexual liberation sometimes sounds like this, like woo woo 1970s concept, free sex, free love. And I don't mean sexual liberation in that way, although that's what you're into. Awesome. Um, sexual liberation is the idea that you are liberated from external factors that have defined sex for you, that you get to decide what's right for you and yourself. It means that you're able to um, feel free to explore and pursue your own desires that you say, hey, I actually really um, want my sexuality to look like this. And so I'm going to explore that. It means that we're able to express desires, consents, consent and our limits. And it means that sexuality is an embodied, integrated part of self. Um, Stacey Haynes, who, write, who wrote the book Healing Sex, which um, I'm sure some of you have read or have on your shelves, um, but Healing Sex, I think, is one of the best books in terms of incorporating sexual pleasure um, with being a survivor. It's, it's like, for a lot of survivors, I think we, we leave them at like, well, sex is always going to be awful for you, and there's always going to be triggers, so let us tell you how to manage the awful parts rather than like, how do you actually come out of um, experiencing a sexual assault and reclaiming pleasure, reclaiming sex for yourself. Healing Sex is the name of the book by Stacey Haynes. And it's really wonderful. But Stacey Haynes does a lot of different work and she talks about embodiment in a way that I just love. She talks about embodiment as being when you're, um, when you're, 
behaviors, actions, and habits align with your values and beliefs, even under pressure. So it's when your behaviors, actions, and habits align with your values and beliefs, even under pressure. And that's what embodiment is. And I don't mean pressure like coercion or an abuse of power. I mean that when you so deeply understand what is important to you, when you so deeply understand who you are, what you like, what you want, what you don't want, and you can really, really own that, and that you say, this is a part of who I am and I know that and I'm not ashamed of it. And, um, and you can really feel ownership and empowerment that you can then align. It becomes very easy to align um, your behaviors and your actions and your habits with that. I'm not saying that it's always aligned 100% of the time. You're not a bad person. If there are times when you do not align, I have deeply, head deeply held values that I sometimes um, act contradictory to, right? We all do that sometimes. But the idea for sex is that we can know ourselves and know our values so deeply that it becomes very easy to, um, to adopt behaviors that are in line with that. That when we understand consent so deeply that we are like, it's easy for me to talk about it. That when we feel that our pleasure matters so much, when we value our own pleasure so much that it becomes easier. I'm not saying that it's always easy. I'm not saying it happens every time. I'm not saying if you're just strong enough, then you'll do it. But I'm saying it becomes easier when we say value our own pleasure and know we deserve pleasure. It becomes easier to align our communication, our behaviors, the way we um, talk to partners um, it becomes easier, right? Because it, because sexuality has become an, an embodied part of ourselves. And I just really love that concept in Stacey Haynes work. The idea is that we're moving people towards self mastery. We are moving people towards, they know themselves, they know their bodies, they know what they like, they know what they don't like, and that they can, um, that they have essentially mastered their sexuality. And that's what we really want to move people towards, not just reducing risk not just reducing perpetration. We want people to feel like they are mastered their sexuality and that's what we're moving people towards. There are ways that I think that sometimes we reinforce some of the problematic narratives instead of moving people towards liberation, we end up moving them back towards, um, towards uh, negativity. Um, some ways that I've seen this happen and you all actually just provided lots of examples of this. Sometimes we, um, add, we add to the hostility or ambivalence towards young people's relationships, right? Um, sometimes I think when we talk about consent, we end up reinforcing this idea that there's always a conqueror or initiator and there's always a gatekeeper. There's always one person who is like, I want this. And then the other person who is like, hmm, I don't know, I have to decide and I'm supposed to keep the gate closed. And right, we know that sex isn't always, doesn't always look that way. But sometimes I think when we talk about consent, we really reinforce the idea that there's like a pursuer and then a person who is like supposed to like resist being pursued, but then maybe they eventually say yes. And I think that is um, really problematic because what we know is that a lot of sex looks like two people showing up and being super excited to being there and having to negotiate a little bit about like, what do I like or what do you like? Um, yeah, what do I like? What do you like? Ooh, I like it when you do this. Oh, I'm not really into this kind of thing, right? We know that a lot of sex actually does look like that, but we don't really show those examples very much. We tend to continue showing this like initiator gatekeeper sort of dynamic rather than showing what some of the other dynamics can look like. And the other narrative I think um, that's very problematic that we don't challenge nearly enough is alcohol as a sexual crutch. Um, wink, wink is actually, we're doing, we haven't posted it yet. So if you go looking for it, you won't see it. But on June 8th, we're doing a um, panel. Uh, uh, it'll be online about sex, alcohol culture, and sobriety. So it's not focused on sexual assault specifically, but it's about our kind of culture's relationship to sex 
and alcohol. And I know that probably most of you are talking about alcohol and how it relates to sex, sexual assault. But I think something that we don't acknowledge that we need to is that alcohol is not just associated with sexual assault. Alcohol is highly associated with sex in general. And there's probably lots of reasons for this. You know, I've done um, some amount of research into this, but this I, we know that alcohol decreases, lowers inhibitions, right? And we often talk about that when we're doing prevention work and we talk about how alcohol, um, you know, is makes people more likely to commit sexual assault. They're still responsible for their behaviors, but we know it puts people at risk of being perpetrators. We know that people who are under the influence of alcohol are more at risk of being sexually assaulted, but we don't often back that up and go, why is alcohol so associated with sex in general? And I think that's because we are very inhibited around the topic of sex. That we are very, um, we feel very closed off. We feel like we can't acknowledge it head on, right? It's behind this curtain. And I think alcohol is used to go beyond the curtain, to open it and to see what's behind it. And I think that we have to be talking about why is alcohol in general, why are alcohol fueled environments and like highly sexual environments, um, why are those linked together in the first place? And I think that's super important for us to make that connection because I don't see people talking about that nearly enough. It's one of those things that's almost like acceptable in um, our culture that sex and alcohol are gonna go together. And when we don't acknowledge that, I think it becomes very difficult to then talk about um, uh, sexual assault and alcohol if we're not acknowledging kind of the wider context that, that it's in. Um, okay. Um, consent when it's rooted in a sex negative framework allows for harmful messages and power imbalances to remain socially desirable. So I'll let that dig into you, dig into your brain for a moment. Um, we tend to teach about consent and sexual assault prevention in a way that it's like, this is the only bad thing. Everything else about sex in our culture is awesome. You just need to have consent. And what we know and what young people know is that that's really not accurate. Um, you know, it's very common for, for, these pow for power imbalances to exist and for what I would consider unacceptable um, violations of desire and limits to exist, um, but that our culture has decided are completely acceptable. And let me talk about some of those. Um, you know, we consider it to be acceptable that we don't really know what our partner wants. And I mean the royal we here. I bet lots of us here don't think that's acceptable. but our culture considers it to be pretty acceptable that we don't really know what our partner wants. We consider it acceptable that um, while we may have consent from them, we don't know if they actually like what we're doing to them. And again, I see that in the shop all the time. I see that often for Valentine's Day when people are shopping for their partners and they'll say, I wanna buy a toy for, for my partner say, okay, what do they, and what do they like? Because I have a million things in the store. It's like, give me some direction. Say, what, what does your partner like? What sensations do they enjoy? And they'll say, oh, I don't really know. And I'm like, okay, well, do you think they enjoy penetration more? Or do you think they enjoy this stimulation or this kind of stimulation? And they're like, well, we usually do this, but I guess I don't really know if they actually like it. And these are often people who've been together for a very long time. We kind of consider that to be acceptable. Um, you know, another, uh, there's so many things I think that we have decided are socially acceptable, um, socially acceptable sex negativity. Um, fake orgasms are a big part of a sex negative culture. If you are a vulva owner, it's very likely that you have faked at least one orgasm in your life. I don't think that that makes you a bad person or a weak person. I have faked orgasms myself, but 
the thing is, is that fake orgasms come from this idea of it's easier to pretend you're enjoying it than it is to either um, say, hey, I'm actually done now, right? Or to say, I actually need this to have an orgasm. And I understand why people do it, but it's really rooted in sex negativity. This idea that um, we would fake it rather than having clear communication with our partner. Um, there are, you know, overperforming um, is something that comes along with that. Um, one of the things I see in the shop a lot is um, shame around sex toys. So again, most folks who have vulvas um, require consistent clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. For many folks, one of the easiest or most effective, most pleasurable ways of achieving that is through the use of, of a vibrator. But what I see a lot of is people think of vibrators as a single people's thing, that you don't use that if you have a partner. I see a lot of penis owners who are feel like a sex toy will replace them. And so they don't want their partners to use those. And what that ends up resulting in is, you know, I just had somebody say this to me the other day. They said, well, I really need a vibrator to have an orgasm, but my partner doesn't like it. So, you know, I just have really learned that like sex with my partner is not about me having an orgasm or me having pleasure. And I think that's such a huge bummer Right. But I also think that's a really common belief or um, we have almost accepted that to be fine. Um, and I think that is a really big bummer and not a great partner. If your partner is like, well, I'm not actively hurting you. I have consent. I just don't really care about whether or not you're experiencing pleasure and my personal comfort and my ego trumps your pleasure, right? I think that's really problematic, but it's almost like we've accepted that as something that is okay. And I, and I think that is, is not, um, okay. I'm going to move on. We're going to fly through the end of this. because I want to get to discussion about what can you actually do? Um, this is an issue that I have with kind of the traditional ways that we've talked about consent. Um, I think some of this has changed, but the way we've traditionally talked about consent is how do we move people away from harm? Or how do we keep harm from happening? How do we, what is harm? What is bad? How do we get people to stop doing bad things? Right, and that's kind of been the way we've traditionally thought about consent. What we haven't talked about it much is what are we moving people towards? And we can say consents or enthusiastic consent, but I think that sometimes we've left that answer, what's on the other side, we've left it pretty unclear. And I think for a lot of different reasons, we've been a little bit afraid to define that. And some of that fear is because um, what's acceptable in our communities and our schools. Um, but we've often left the vision too murky. In a sex positive consent framework, we're asking, how do we move people towards pleasure? How do we move people towards good lives? How do we move people towards sexuality that feels amazing and wonderful for them? How do we move people towards not just not harming people, but how do we move people towards actually having um, the sex life that they want to have? And so it's really important, I think, if we're looking through a lens of sex positivity that we're very clear on, on, on what that green circle is. This is where I think most people are left, which is harm. We know that we don't want harm. We're also, we, we also don't necessarily want people to have pleasure. For many young people particularly, it's this idea of harm is unacceptable. Pleasure is also maybe unacceptable. And we leave people in this very confused situation um, where, where they're not sure what to do. Um, I think that we can move people away from harm when we have a vision that they want to buy. Again, we're salespeople, right? When we have a vision that they want to buy and adopt, that sounds great. Then they go, I don't want that. I don't want that horrible, harmful thing. I want this instead. 
right? But when we leave both of those things as bad or undefined or unacceptable, it leaves people without a clear direction of where to go. And I think one of the things that I see happening a lot kind of in wider conversations is there is a fear again of defining what pleasure is. So we continue to redefine what harm is. And that work is super important for us to define what harm is. It's very important for us to define what is unacceptable. But sometimes I think that because we are not sure what, what we actually want, we continue to redefine what we don't want. And um, just maybe be aware of when you feel yourself doing that. Okay, how can you integrate sex positivity into, into your work? This is finally like the answer you were all looking for. Again, these answers are gonna be different for everybody. Um, and uh, I have curriculum that I use for younger folks. I've been sex ed for teens classes. I'm doing this um, more uh, healthy relationships and, and sexuality class right now um, that I've just written myself. but. Um, the answer is going to look different for every person. And these are just some things to consider as you're putting together curriculum or reviewing what you're already doing. First, acknowledge your own judgments and limitations. We all, you know, we all have messages coming at us. We all grew up with certain messages. Um, there may be things that we are um, uncomfortable with ourselves. Um, so know what those are because you can better be aware of when you might be um, reinforcing sex negativity if you are aware of what your own judgments and limitations are. So, um, you know, if there are things in this presentation that, you know, I said group sex or queer sex or whatever it is, and you went, um, no, no, what know what those are for you um, and then acknowledge those and then work to deconstruct some of your own judgments and limitations because I think that. Um, we can reinforce messages that we don't want to when we don't know um, our own judgments. And we may not think that we're doing it, but other people see those. Um, acknowledge that you care about your participant's sexual well being. I think stating that clearly that you are talking about prevention as one piece, right? of um, their sex education. I want you to have a sexuality that makes you feel good. I want you to have sexual experiences that you want to have that make you feel really good in your life. Your sexuality is normal. It's a normal part of who you are. It's healthy. It, if, you, if sexual pleasure is something you enjoy, that's really normal right? But being really, really clear that you're not just adding to the list of things that you expect young people to screw up, that you're here because you want them to enjoy their sexuality, that you want them to enjoy your sex life. And you can, you know, attune that message to whatever age you're in front of, but making sure that they know that this is because you want them to actually enjoy their sexuality um, and that you care about their sexual well-being. Talk about both good sex and sexual assault. Again, you may not use the term, may not want to use the term good sex, but I think that there are ways of asking about um, what does, not just what does healthy sexuality look like? Like I'm not, when I'm pursuing sex in my life, I'm not like, I really want to have healthy sex, right? I mean, I do want that, but it's in the greater context of like, what feels good to me. So asking people to think about what do you think good sex is? What would good sex be to you? Uh, you can ask about, you know, what it, what is healthy sex, but um, what are some things that, that um, and you, I, you know, you can always ask like the broader questions instead of what do you think good sex is? How, how do you think people would describe good sex, right? But embedding sexual assault into wider conversations about what good sex is. Um, is really, really important. Being honest, realistic, and nuanced, making sure that what you're talking about is reflective of reality. Um, young people, like they had all the same answers to questions that you did. I've asked young people before, you know, what, what is sex? And they're like, what do people think of when you think of sex? And they're like, oh, penis and vagina, heterosex, missionary style, right? Young people 
know those same messages. So being honest um, and reflecting what's actually happening on the ground. I know one thing that I always struggled with, and I'm sure lots of other people did too, is the conversation around like alcohol and sexual assault. And, you know, th th there's this, uh, it's, it's like we used to at least teach sexual assault where it was like, you can't consent if you're under the influence. And then every presentation, somebody goes, so it's always sexual assault if one person's under the influence. You're like, well, kind of more nuanced than that, right? And so I think that we have to be nuanced. We have to be realistic because if we're selling something that's not believable, people will throw away all of our messages. Be culturally relevant. Who's in the room? Are we teaching about um, assumptions and stereotypes? Are we teaching about sexual aggression that is race-based, that is abilities-based, that is, are we talking about, um, are we talking about violence towards trans people? Are we talking about bi erasure, like the idea that bisexuality isn't real, right? But we need to be culturally relevant for who is in our room and who our audience is. Let participants teach each other. So um, I can go in and I can say, um, here's what good sex is. Here's what desire is. Here's why pleasure matters. But let participants teach each other. Um, it's more powerful than coming from, um, from you. And again, this is that idea of centering individuals and centering their own experiences, but letting people hear from each other um, about the importance of feeling good, the importance of pleasure. Understand and question sex negative narratives. So really thinking about where is um, where is sex negativity um, showing up and how do you um, talk about it? So I try not to shut people down. If somebody says um, something that's sex negative in a presentation, I said, tell me more about that. Where did you learn that from? Does everybody agree with that? You know, um, how do you think that feels to that person? You know, why do you think we believe that a, a person who has a lot of sex um, holds less value? Where does that idea come from, right? So questioning those sex negative narratives without being like, well, you're a terrible person for thinking that. Um, Malia said, getting participant partici voices in the room, I, something I've struggled with in these conversations. Yeah, it can be super challenging because, um, sometimes people are, are embarrassed to talk about this. So I try to frame my questions really like uh, very easy answers. Like in my, you know, my classes that I'm doing with seventh and eighth graders now, it's a lot of like building up to concepts. What's the difference between um, friendships and romantic relationships? Let's teach each other about this. Great. Um, do you think romantic relationships are necessary in our lives? Or do you think it's okay to not have romantic relationships? Do you think everybody has, um, do you think everybody has sex? Or do you think some people aren't having sex? Um, if people are having sex, do you think it's important to communicate to each other? Why would that be important to communicate to each other? What are some things that you think people should be communicating about, right? Um, what are some things that are hard for people to communicate about? Why is that difficult for us to communicate about? Okay, now that we've talked about all that, let me talk to you a little bit about, you know, whatever it is. So trying to ask questions that I feel like are going to be answerable um, and then adding in my own information on there. Um, let's see here. Hold on. I know there's a question. I'm going to get through these last couple of slides. Oh my gosh, how do I get the Q&A back off my screen? Okay, well, I will answer now. <laughs> um, how do you address people feeling like one person's sex positivity is another person's sexual harassment? How do you explore these differences? So sex positivity, you know, at the center of sex positivity is that um, is, is consensuality and autonomy and agency. The idea that like um, my, uh, you know, I can, um, pursue my own pleasure, but that needs, that is never without respecting another person, right? So if my, if I gain pleasure from, um, I don't know, uh, looking at women's breasts on the street, right? That's obviously unacceptable because I am now engaging in a pleasure without other people's consent. So sex positivity is, um, is not to say like, you're not, um, consensuality and getting and people's personal choice and everybody getting to make decisions for themselves um, is 
part of sex positivity. I don't know if that answers the question, but, um, but you don't just get to say, well, this is what I like. So I get to do this, even if other people don't enjoy it. Um, the idea is that you are, you, your positivity ends at the end of your own body, right? And you have to respect other people. Um, so you don't just get to say this, this feels good. So I get to do it without, um, without considering other people's autonomy or agency, um, autonomy and agency are a huge part of sex positivity. Um, it's not positive if we're forcing it on another person or making other people uncomfortable. Okay. Me. I can't get back to my slides. I'm not sure what happened here. That Q and A. There we go. Um, talk about gender norms and pleasure. Um, so I see sometimes when uh, we're talking about gender norms, we end up sort of like reinforcing gender norms without challenging them. So we go, hey, okay, what are the gender norms associated with this person? And what are the gender norms associated with this person? Um, okay, moving on, <laughs> right? Or we don't really talk about, actually, there are lots of, there are lots of people are, of all genders who are soft. And there are lots of people of all genders who are asking for consent. It is still the norm. We talk about how common sexual assault is. And it, of course, it's, it's devastatingly common. It's also still more common for people to, to ask for consent. It's still more common for people to respect each other's bodies and to not um, abuse power. And so I think it's important that we're not reinforcing gender norms when we talk about sexual assault or we talk about um, when we talk about um, uh, when we talk about sex in general, that we don't just name them without challenging them. Right. I always wish that um, we talked more about actually most people are having consensual sex. Most people are respectful of each other's bodies. It is the exception and not the norm to be committing sexual assault. And I think that um, I think that sometimes we don't emphasize that enough that um, we end up teaching very gendered sexual assault prevention and, um, and can walk away with it saying like, what I would want people to walk away with is to say, if I'm like a, a, a young man that I'm like, oh, most of my classmates are actually asking for consent. Most of my classmates are, um, are being respectful. And I, I don't think we emphasize that enough because I think we point out gender norms without challenging them. Um, we need to address fetishization and violations based on race, class, ability, and isms. I covered that a couple minutes ago, but so much sexual assault prevention ignores this, which means we are ignoring um, very, very common experiences for people of color, people with disabilities, people who are trans, people who are queer, that we are kind of we are um, whitewashing our sexual assault prevention because we're not being specific um, about these types of violations that are specific to certain communities. We have to talk about rejection. Um, we have to talk about what happens on the other side of consent. Um, we have to talk about the fear of judgment or the fear of rejection being a barrier to consent. And um, we have to talk about how to handle reject gracefully, rejection gracefully, right? Um, we have to, sex positivity would say rejection is helpful. Rejection is useful information. Rejection saying, hey, I really, I like this. What do you think? The person saying, I'm not really into that. That part of being a sex positive person is being able to go, okay, um, that you can make space for that person's rejection. We have to talk about porn. Um, we have to talk about pornography and we have to talk about it in a way that checks our own judgments. Um, so many young people are seeing and learning from porn, um, and we have to talk about how it's made, um, what's fake about it, what's not fake about it. Um, we have to talk about the acts that you're seeing and, and the parts that you're not seeing, that you don't see the contracts and negotiations and lube being used and the 10 hours it took to film a five minute scene, right? But we have to talk about pornography because it's a really integral part of the way that young people are learning about sex right now. Um, helping participants claim their pleasure. If you Google yes, no, maybe lists, you'll see um, some different strategies um, for how people um, 
think about what their desires are. Um, BDSM is a, I didn't really go into that today, but BDSM um, for people who are playing with power dynamics, those um, boundaries are often really explicit and written down sometimes and negotiated, but there are lots of ways um, that we can actually help people say, what do you like and what do you not like? Uh, you will not want to use any of the yes, no, maybe lists that you find online for young people, um, but creating some of your own and helping them to think about what they like or don't like um, would be a really helpful thing, I think, for a lot of young folks. And expand your own knowledge. There are different ways to do that. You'll get this afterwards. These are all um, folks you can follow on Instagram or read more about online that are doing a lot of really wonderful work. Here are some uh, great books. I also, I didn't put healing sex on here, but um, here's some wonderful books and you'll get an email afterwards with links to these. Um, but expanding your own knowledge is super important. I have one minute, sorry to rush the end of this. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay for a couple um, uh, extra minutes here and answer any questions that you might have. I wish that we were all here in person so we could have done like, um, more Q and A, um, but I want to thank you all for the work that you um, that you all do. Sexual assault prevention is my heart and soul. It's you know personally and professionally important to me, and um, I just want to thank all of you that for 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 what you're doing. I know um, sometimes it can feel like an uphill battle or that the work's not appreciated or that maybe you're not going anywhere, but you are, you are changing hearts and minds and um, what you do is so incredibly important. Um, yes, you will be receiving um, people and books that were recommended that are in the slides. You're welcome to contact me. My email is on there. Um, you're welcome to contact me for anything. I also do consulting for um, individual organizations around um, how can you make your advocacy work or your prevention a more sex positive. It's something I did for DV SAS of Whatcom County um, is we, I did a two hour long, it was two hour long, two trainings with them about how to make the work that they're doing in their agency and serving clients more sex positive. So if that's something that you're interested in for your agency, um, go ahead and reach out to me. Now that things are online, those presentations are very easy um, for me to do wherever you're at. So thank you all so much. Um, feel free to reach out with any other questions that you have. And um, I guess, will I turn it back over to Kat or um, I will say goodbye to you all now. Thank you so much, Jen. That was really wonderful. I see in the chat, a lot of other folks are sharing already how much they enjoyed this. So thank you for your time today. And thanks for sharing so much with us. Um, I put in the chat that I'll be sending an email later today with the slides. Um, there are a ton of resources in there that Jen sent, and I added a few that came up in the chat. Uh, there's a really quick evaluation that I know is helpful to Wixap, and I'm sure it's helpful to Jen. We love your feedback. Um, we hope you take it. And our final keynote of the series is tomorrow. We hope you can join us. I'll put a link in your follow-up email for that as well. Thank you again. Take care.